Hi, everyone. We thank you for joining us for today's JJ Keller webinar. I'm going to get started here in about a minute or so. Just want to allow some time for everyone to get logged on and settle in. But you are in the right place, and we will get going in about another minute or so. Hello once again, everyone. Want to let you know as you file in, you are in the right place for the JJ Keller webinar. Just allowing folks to get in and get settled. Going to get going in about another 30 seconds or so. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, OSHA update. Catch up on the latest rules, enforcement trends, and initiatives, sponsored by JJ Keller. My name is Kevin Drewley. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I wanna go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication doesn't mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Excuse me. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey that will appear on a separate screen. We'll let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com events. You may also receive a link in a post-event email. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today are Tricia Hodkovich and Rachel Krupsack. Tricia is an EHS editor at J.J. Keller, who for 20 plus years has provided content for safety and environmental related publications on subjects including hazard communication, hazardous waste operations and emergency response, bloodborne pathogens, signs and labels, and written plans. Using the personal assistant feature of Keller Online, she also has filtered thousands of regulatory questions from EHS professionals. Rachel is also an EHS editor at J.J. Keller, and she joined the organization in 2010. Rachel researches and creates content on topics such as hazard communication, lockout tagout, emergency action plans, safety training, and safety management. Rachel also edits various newsletters and manuals and writes content for the handbooks, webcasts, and online solutions while assisting customers with regulatory questions related to EHS topics. Trisha and Rachel, we thank you for being here today. Trisha, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Kevin. So, hello, everyone. Today's webcast is presented by J.J. Keller's newest addition to our growing family of world-class EHS solutions. Tackle tomorrow's problems today with J.J. Keller Safety Management Suite. This ready resource provides round-the-clock access to all of J.J. Keller's most popular safety management tools, making it easy to develop a full-service safety program from the ground up. On behalf of JJ Keller Management Safety Management Suite, thank you for joining us. The Occupational Safety and Health Act uh, was passed by Congress and signed in 1970 and then enacted in 1971. And that means we've had 50 years with this landmark law. Even with the dramatic improvements to workplace safety and health over the last five decades, OSHA says its mission is as important as ever. So today, what comes to mind when you think of OSHA? Is it the recent proposals for hazard communication and walking working surfaces? Maybe it's the agency's crackdown on injury and illness non-reporters. For others, it may be OSHA's work on COVID-19 worker protections or its efforts to prevent falls in construction. As if all that's not enough, the agency plans a jam-packed roster for the coming year, including but not limited to rulemakings on powered industrial trucks, drug testing, and injury tracking. And with a new OSHA head confirmed just yesterday, the agency will have 
a firm guidance to forge ahead. Also, armed with a hefty budget, OSHA enforcement is not anticipated to let up anytime soon. As always, the J.J. Keller Safety Management Suite has been monitoring these and other OSHA activities closely, and we're very happy you could join us today for this web webinar, uh, which will focus on the agency's latest and upcoming activities affecting general industry, construction, and shipyards, and we will cover the items listed on this slide. Now, we know how important it is to stay informed of upcoming regulatory changes. And since the J.J. Keller Safety Management Suite is sponsoring today's event, and we can advance the slide here, great. Okay, so we would like to offer our attendees access to a wide range of compliance resources, such as white papers, webcasts, and case studies at no cost. The Safety Management Suite also offers a direct line to pressing industry news and regulatory change notices. Along with your access to free compliance resources in this site, we'll also email you a digital copy of our top EHS practices white paper. So please use the poll that is on your screen, all right, to select your interests. And while you select your interests, uh, I thought I would share, you know, the latest news here, uh, a little bit more about the new OSHA head, Douglas Parker, who formerly served as chief of Cal OSHA since 2019. So he led the agency during this COVID-19 pandemic, and he has established pretty much a record in fighting for worker safety as an attorney of the United Mine Workers of America and has or was a senior official for the Mine Safety and Health Administration or MSHA. Now, Parker was confirmed yesterday in the Senate with a vote of 50 to 41. And now I'll turn it over to Rachel. Okay, thank you, Tricia. The president used an executive order to revoke six executive orders from the last administration that related to regulations and guidance. Now OSHA no longer needs to identify two existing regulations to be repealed whenever it wants to propose or finalize a new one. Also, OSHA is not required to maintain a public database of guidance documents. Basically, the executive order gives OSHA the freedom to issue any and all new rulemakings and guidance. Another executive order, 13999, directed OSHA to, de to determine if an emergency standard on COVID-19 was needed, and if so, to issue it, and we've seen that rule already. The order also called on OSHA to strengthen COVID-19 guidance and launch an enforcement program to focus on COVID-19 related violations that put the largest number of workers at risk. We've seen those happen too. Also, last month, under a new action plan, the president ordered OSHA to issue another rule to ensure worker vaccination and testing. That rule is still coming. In fiscal year 2021, OSHA was budgeted for about $592 million, but the American Rescue Plan Act injected the OSHA budget with another $100 million, with a grand total nearly $692 million. To keep the momentum going, the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget asks for $664 million. If that amount is granted, OSHA will be able to hire 362 more full-time employees and push through more rules and conduct more inspections. Here are the OSHA final rules that we're going to examine today. They relate to the OSH Act, COVID-19, cranes in construction, beryllium, and a series of regulatory corrections. Recently, OSHA published the discrimination rule. The OSH Act says workers have protected rights. The new rule clarifies that if an employer discharges or takes adverse actions, and those actions would not have taken place but for the worker engaging in a protected activity, then the employer has violated the OSH Act. Also, the protected activity does not need to be the substantial, sole, or primary reason for the adverse action. You've probably heard that OSHA issued its final Emergency Temporary Standard, or ETS, for COVID-19, but it focuses only on healthcare employers. Originally, the rule was to have a broader scope and applicability, but the agency decided at the last minute that at this time, the virus presents a grave danger to workers in healthcare settings. 
the ETS creates 29 CFR 1910 subpart U with the key provisions you see listed here. The federal ETS establishes minimum requirements for private employers in every state. States, of course, may be more stringent. Excellent, Rachel, thank you. So in response to a settlement agreement, uh, OSHA finalized a rule impacting the Cranes and Derrickson construction standard. Because the rule is deregulatory, the 28 states and territories with OSHA approved state plans were not required to adopt the changes. This rule basically makes the crane rule for construction more applicable to railroad cranes. Key highlights of the rule include adding new regulations dedicated to seven exemptions for railroad roadway maintenance machines and amending the regulations to exempt certain trucks and other railroad roadway maintenance machines not equipped with certain hoisting devices. In 2020, OSHA finalized amendments to its general industry standard for exposure to beryllium. Because beryllium is a metal stronger than steel and lighter than aluminum, it's used in many industries. Beryllium is also highly toxic and workers who inhale beryllium at, are at an increased risk of developing chronic beryllium disease or lung cancer. OSHA says the latest amendments maintain general industry worker protections and ensure the standard is well understood and compliance is straightforward. Also in 2020, uh, OSHA finalized amendments to its uh, shipyard and uh, construction standards for beryllium. OSHA had considered tossing these regulations except for their exposure limits, but OSHA found that the ancillary provisions were important for the protection of shipyard and construction workers. So instead, the changes tailored the regulations to these two industries. The hygiene provisions were removed because they duplicated existing sanitation standards. OSHA announced its long-awaited final rule to correct certain typographical errors, extraneous or omitted information, outdated references, and inaccurate graphics in its regulations. Specifically, the final rule revised the regulations you see listed here. The corrections and revisions were minor and did not expand employer obligations or impose new costs. Rachel. All right, thank you. Let's examine the OSHA proposed rulemakings relating to power presses, walking working surfaces, and hazard communication. OSHA explains that its 40-year-old mechanical power presses standard has failed to keep up with technological changes. In fact, the standard does not address the use of hydraulic or pneumatic power presses. The agency tried proposing updates in 2007, but further action stalled. Now, OSHA is starting again, this time with a request for information, which the agency recently published. OSHA welcomes comments, but the deadline is today, October 26. You can comment on almost 70 related questions to help the agency determine how to proceed and whether to amend 1910-217. Questions touch on economic impacts, hazards, consensus standards, affected industries, and other issues. Commenters may address any aspect of power presses, including mechanical, hydraulic, and pneumatic presses. This action is part of a larger push to review outmoded, ineffective, and burdensome regulations. The date of a proposed rule, if, if any, is a ways off. OSHA has walking working surfaces regulations, including provisions for handrails and steer rail systems. However, a recent proposal corrects and clarifies the requirements after OSHA received numerous questions since 2016. Table D2 of 29 CFR 1910-28 touches on stairways with two open sides, having at least three treads and four risers and a width of less than 44 inches. For these particular types of stairways, OSHA clarifies that a handrail is required on each open side with the exception of stair rail systems installed before the effective date of any upcoming final rule. OSHA also proposes to revise 1910-29 paragraph F to require stair rail systems not less than 42 inches in height to have a separate handrail 30 to 38 inches in height, but the top rail may serve as a handrail if the steer rail system is installed before the effective date of any upcoming final rule and meets handrail requirements. The date of such a final rule is to be determined. If you fall under the hazard communication or HASCOM standard at 29 CFR 1910-1200, 
be aware that OSHA proposed changes throughout. The proposal is intended to align the standard with Revision 7 of the Globally Harmonized System, or GHS. It also aims to clarify requirements and reduce costs. Specifically, if finalized, the proposal would make the changes listed on the slide. OSHA wants to add definitions for terms like bulk shipment, combustible dust, immediate outer package, released for shipment, and other terms. The proposal adds some new hazard classes and categories, as well as hazard classification requirements for chemicals sold together with the intention of mixing them. The proposal addresses the, the labeling of small containers, shipments in tanker trucks or rail cars, and packages released for shipment that are awaiting future distribution. Required content for the safety data sheet would be revised and concentration ranges could be claimed a trade secret. While the proposal mainly impacts chemical manufacturers, importers, and distributors, employers would need to maintain any updated safety sheets received and train employees in new chemical hazards that arrive at work. A final issue date, rule date, is to be determined. The last agenda was our first glimpse at what the new administration wants to do with OSHA regulations. None of these here on the slide appeared in the Federal Register, even though some of these dates have gone by. Now we address emergency response, heat illness, and infectious diseases in a bit. So let's touch on the items in red. OSHA will propose to uh, update its ANSI reference in the powered industrial truck standards for general industry and construction, new trucks would have to meet the design and construction provisions of more modern ANSI standards. The process safety management or PSM standard is meant to prevent catastrophic chemical release incidents. OSHA has been considering revisions to PSM coverage, adding to the list of covered substances and aligning the standards to consensus standards. A stakeholder meeting is on the agenda. To improve tracking, uh, the improved tracking proposal, excuse me, uh, with this administration, OSHA intends to restore the requirement to electronically submit information from the OSHA 300 and 301 forms for establishments with 250 or more employees if they are not exempted from OSHA record keeping. So watch for a proposal in December. Another proposal would amend the Cranes and Derricks standard for construction to correct references, broaden exclusions, provide definitions, change some terminology, and make clarifications. The last agenda continued with these planned actions, and we'll touch on workplace violence and drug testing on later slides. So in red now, Back in 2019, OSHA collected comments about advancements in technology for controlling hazardous energy, also called lockout tagout. And now the agency intends to propose a rule in January to modernize the standard and reduce regulatory burdens. Communication towers. OSHA says tower construction and maintenance activities are not adequately protected by current fall protection and personnel hoisting standards. So the agency plans to revise its standards. OSHA already requested information to help it identify the hazards these workers face. The next step is a proposal. Tree care continues to be a high hazard industry. OSHA is working on a proposal, but a draft proposal included elements like a written plan, job hazard analysis, traffic control, electrical hazards, PPE training, and multi-employer protections. And lastly, a rulemaking on OSHA's long-term list would restore a column to the 300 log that would indicate cases of musculoskeletal disorders. This month, OSHA has convened a small business panel to review a draft comprehensive emergency response standard to protect workers in general industry, construction, and maritime who respond to emergencies as part of their regularly assigned duties. While broader than the fire brigade standard, the new standard would replace existing 1910.156. OSHA says existing standards are not designed to address the full range of hazards or concerns currently facing emergency responders and skilled support nor do they reflect changes in performance specifications for personal protective equipment and clothing. 
Now we were able to get a look at the latest draft proposal, which lists the regulatory elements you see here on the slide. OSHA will now get the panel's input before the agency may proceed to the proposal stage and a report is anticipated in December. OSHA will publish its official heat injury and illness prevention advance notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register tomorrow. And this notice will allow OSHA to gather perspectives and expertise on heat stress thresholds, acclimatization, uh, monitoring, and worker protections from both outdoor and indoor heat. The notice, which is available in a pre-publication version today, reveals that OSHA is soliciting information on 114 questions on everything from covered industries and jobs, geographic regions, uh, existing heat illness prevention efforts, all the way to control measures and the cost of the rule. There's even questions on climate change and underreporting of heat related illnesses and fatalities. Now that notice gives you 60 days to comment. To date, uh, a few states and the military have issued heat protections. Federal OSHA relies currently on the General Duty Clause or Section 5A1 of the OSHA Act to protect workers from heat hazards. The trouble is it's, it's more difficult to protect workers from heat stress in light of a contest case decision. In that case, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission found in 2020 that OSHA failed to establish a condition or activity at the sited employer's worksite that presented an excessive heat hazard, even though the heat index was well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The case hinged on OSHA's use of the National Weather Service heat index chart, which does not explain the basis for its color coding risk categories, nor does it define the terms prolonged exposure or strenuous activity. So without that information, OSHA's use of the chart cannot demonstrate a violation. A rulemaking though would make it easier for OSHA to cite employers for heat related violations. Note that since 1972, NIOSH has recommended that OSHA issue a heat stress rule and again recommended regulatory elements in 2016. Uh, Rachel. OSHA is finally moving on a proposed rule to prevent and control infectious diseases in what the agency calls high-risk environments like hospitals, emergency response operations, prisons, homeless shelters, drug treatment centers, labs, mortuaries, and other work settings. A small business panel met years ago to review a draft regulatory framework and issued their report voicing many concerns, and the review resulted in a general recommendation that OSHA not issue a proposed rule until the agency has assessed information on the risk to each potentially covered task and workplace. The report suggested exempting work settings that do not routinely provide infectious patient care and work settings that are adequately covered by the bloodborne pathogen standard. The panel also thought that a new rule may not be needed because the CDC offers guidance. Others suggested adopting CDC standards. Another approach was to focus the rule solely on training. Of course, that was all before the COVID-19 pandemic. There's more pressure now for the agency to issue a rule, but a proposal comes first and is expected to be issued in December. Last month, the president ordered OSHA to issue another emergency temporary standard, this time to require private employers with at least 100 employees to ensure that employees are either vaccinated or tested for COVID-19 weekly before coming to work. However, employers may choose to require the vaccine without, re without allowing for a testing option. The rule will also require covered employers to give their employees paid time off to get vaccinated and to recover from post-vaccination reactions. OSHA completed the final rule and sent it to the White House for review two weeks ago. This one is expected to be approved and issued quickly. The Obama administration granted a petition for a rule on workplace violence. And while the last administration said it was a priority, it kept kicking the can on the, on the next step, the small business panel. With a new administration, we should see this one move forward. When a small business panel begins, often OSHA provides a draft rule or at least an outline for the panel to review. 
Right now, OSHA cites the general duty clause when it finds employers that expose their workers to this recognized hazard. OSHA says a regulation on work violence would help clarify your obligations and the measures needed to protect workers. In May 2016, OSHA added a regulation that employers not have any barriers for employees to report injuries or illnesses. The rule also said that employers could not discriminate or punish employees for being injured. While the rule itself didn't address drug testing or incentive programs, policy guidance published along with it indicated that most post-incident drug testing programs would be in violation. The same thing was said about incentive programs that were tied to injury rates. Then in 2018, OSHA clarified that the regulations do not prohibit post-incident drug testing or safety incentive programs. The memo discussed several permissible drug testing and incentives programs and explained that they would only be in violation if the employer took the action to penalize an employee for reporting an injury or illness. The previous administration had hoped to memorialize this position in the regulations. This rulemaking item is still on the agenda, but the new administration pushed it from short term to long term. It's hard to say, but it's possible we may see the original 2016 policy make a comeback. Before we move on to enforcement highlights, we'd like to ask attendees which upcoming regulatory change will impact you the most. Is it the regulatory changes to standards on hazard communication, powered industrial trucks, or lockout tagout? Is it improved tracking, COVID-19 vaccination and testing, or heat illness prevention? And please go ahead and lock in your selection. We talked about all of these regulatory changes today. Some of these may be more impactful than others, so we'd like to know what you think, and we will share your results. This is just a quick poll, so just a few more seconds, and we'll take a look and see what affects most people. And thank you for your participation. Okay, so it looks like about 62% of you say that the COVID-19 vaccination will impact you the most. And this is followed by hazard communication with 12%, lock, uh, heat illness with 9%, lockout tagout with 7%, powered industrial trucks with 6%, and improved tracking at 4%. Safety Management Suite is watching all of these and other regulatory changes closely. Thank you, Rachel. So. Here are the OSHA enforcement highlights we'll be covering, including strategies, directives, and violations. OSHA continues to keep a list of employers fined $40,000 or more. Over 8,800 of these high penalty cases uh, have occurred since January 2015. The largest penalty in the bunch is almost $2.9 million. Significant cases are, are those with fines exceeding $180,000. There have been about 570 of those since January 2015. OSHA can cite for egregious and per instance willful violations. One of these cases made headlines several weeks ago. Uh, two workers died after a dump truck struck and pushed them into a nine foot tr deep trench. And because the employer had six untrained workers and a history of violations, OSHA multiplied the $136,000 training violation by six for a total of just under $820,000. In the end, OSHA cited the company for 28 violations with a proposed $1.35 million fine. In recent years, we've seen more felony cases involving OSHA violations. The Department of Justice steps in to prosecute OSHA violators for penalties or felonies, excuse me, uh, something OSHA cannot do. So for instance, a company owner is facing a possible 10 years in prison after recently pleading guilty to lying to OSHA and making illegal tank repairs that led to an explosion that severely injured an employee. One failure to abate case caught our attention. A worker lost fingers attempting to clear a jammed machine and the company's fine for three violations started at just $9,000 but jumped to almost $270,000 when it failed to abate cited lockout tagout and machine guarding hazards. Failure to report. Uh, Employers have to notify OSHA of any work-related fatality, hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye. 
Non-fatality uh, reports are called severe injury reports. Failure to report typically carries a five to $7,000 fine. However, if OSHA learns that you knew about the requirement but chose not to report it promptly, the fine can be much higher, up to the maximum $136,532. OSHA has also made the information from the severe injury reports available online to the public. It includes employer names and addresses, industry codes, and narratives of each of the reported events, sanitized of any personally identifiable information about the injured or ill workers. The data includes over 63,700 reports from January 2015 to March 2021. That's about 850 reports a month. Okay, so a year ago, OSHA started posting the Form 300A data submitted by covered employers under 1904-41. The information shows submissions from 2016 to 2020. For each submitter, the data reveal the employer name, address and industry, number of injuries, illnesses and deaths, and number of days away and job transfer or restriction cases. The idea is employers will be nudged into compliance because their data is posted for everyone to see. The Severe Violator Enforcement Program targets serious and persistent violators. These companies too are listed on the internet and required to undergo follow-up OSHA inspections. You'll find 687 employers on the log right now. 69% of these listed employers have 20 or fewer employees. The agency also shames violators by posting hard-hitting press releases. And since the new administration, we see the press releases a day or so after citations are issued, including a link to the actual citations and penalty amounts. In January, six employees went to work at a poultry processing plant unaware they would not return home. Just after their shift began, a freezer at the plant malfunctioned, releasing colorless, odorless liquid nitrogen, displacing the oxygen in the room. Now OSHA cited four companies, the food processor, gas delivery service, equipment service, and sanitation service for a total of 59 violations and almost $1 million in proposed penalties. Under multi-employer enforcement, OSHA claims all four companies are responsible for the facility operations. Another OSHA strategy is multi-location enforcement. Let's say your Atlanta location was cited last year, but now your Houston location is cited this year for the same violation. Now the agency may issue a more costly repeat citation for the Houston location, or OSHA may visit your other locations looking for repeats or call for entire enterprises to fix a specific violation at all locations or else face repeat violations. OSHA can arrange a corporate-wide settlement. Uh, a national retailer paid $465,000 to settle an OSHA case. The settlement requires the retailer to set up a program to ensure that materials are stored safely and that exit routes are unobstructed at 200 of its stores. OSHA will conduct follow-up inspections. The agency takes settlements seriously. Recently, a company settled with a $122,000 penalty, but when the company failed to abate violations, failed to comply with the settlement or submit documentation, another $180,000 was added. More follow-up inspections found willful repeat and serious violations, and now the company faces $600,000 in penalties. Finally, even though OSHA has no workplace violence regulation, a court upheld a citation involving the general duty clause after an inpatient psychiatric hospital was cited for inadequately protecting its workers from patient aggression. OSHA implements 10 inspection programs nationwide. These are called national emphasis programs that target certain industries and certain hazards. OSHA's NEP for COVID-19 updated in July targets high-risk industries in healthcare and non-healthcare. The agency issued an NEP in 2020 targeting 43 industries with high silica exposures. An amputations NEP was started in 2019, still going on. It aims at 75 manufacturing subsectors. OSHA is also developing another NEP to target high-risk industries with high hazards. OSHA has a secret list of targets under its site-specific targeting or SST program, which runs through December 2022. 
The agency selects random targets of non-construction, non-office, non-government workplaces with 20 or more employees that are either considered high rate establishments, meaning with the highest rates of injuries and illnesses, or upward trending establishments with rates above their industry's national average in 2017 that continued to trend upward in 2018 and 2019. For construction, every month, each OSHA office is provided with a randomly selected list of construction projects from all known active projects. All sites on the list must be inspected, and typically no site will be selected for inspection more frequently than once per trimester. And finally, there's over 100 regional and local inspection programs covering more industries and hazards. Just an example, in recent weeks, OSHA regions five and six began targeting seven industries in 11 states that clean or inspect truck and rail car tanks. Uh, just last week, Region 7 announced it's tar that it is targeting health hazards like asbestos and other substances in 50 different manufacturing and service industries over the next five years. Recently, OSHA issued noteworthy directives or instructions for the inspector, but you can use them to help you understand the regulations, when the regulations apply, and what you need to do to comply. Recent compliance directives cover the excavation, COVID-19, and silica standards. The latest field operations manual, which goes over how the agency implements inspections, issues citations, and proposes penalties, also has a new chapter on how OSHA will release inspection records under the Freedom of Information Act. This enables public access to government records upon request. OSHA issued a CPL on corporate-wide settlements where if a serious hazard is found at one establishment and, and it's likely the same hazard may be occurring at other establishments, a corporate-wide settlement should be considered. OSHA currently follows an enforcement memo on drones, but the agency says it anticipates a new directive any day to cover the agency's procedures for using drones for inspections. With less than 20 drones, the agency has been using them for a few years to get at work areas inaccessible to an inspector, areas that pose a hazard to the inspector, or situations where it is an emergency. The directive will require qualified and trained persons to operate the drones. OSHA also tells us that a directive on, state, on crane operator certification will be issued shortly. It is in the final review stage. Thank you, Rachel. So enforcement memos are aimed at OSHA offices and inspectors to instruct them in how to enforce something. And the agency rolled out several in the last year. The memo issued last month prioritizes heat related outdoor and indoor inspections for general industry, construction, agriculture, and maritime on days when the heat index exceeds 80 degrees. The July memo provides instruction for handling COVID-19 related complaints for workplaces not covered by the emergency temporary standard. The June memo recognizes the link between tree trimming and removal hazards and existing standards on falls, falling objects, ladders, aerial lifts, power line safety, noise, PPE, and others. A May memo instructs OSHA inspectors to take time during each inspection to determine whether the employer was required to submit Form 300A data under 1904.41, but failed to do so. OSHA published interim enforcement guidance in April for its beryllium rules. And you can gain insight about the regulations by uh, reviewing these inspection and citation procedures. In January, the agency listed high, medium, and low gravity-based penalty amounts that will be assigned for violations, as well as penalty reductions based on employer size. Two memos were issued in December. One instructs instruct inspectors to make reasonable efforts to obtain an establishment's employer identification number before and during an inspection. The other memo outlines steps the agency will take to pressure violators who fail to pay their penalties on time to actually pay their penalties. OSHA issued a final rule to raise its penalties. Maximum penalties are about 1% higher, and these adjustments are made each year for inflation. OSHA state plan states must align their private employer penalties to maintain at least as effective penalty levels. 
Congress has the power to adjust these amounts if they pass a law to amend the OSH Act. Some legislators in the House would like, really like to push the maximum penalty to $700,000 for willful or repeat violations and $70,000 for serious and failure to abate violations. Right now though, note the failure to abate violations are tallied per day and are generally limited to 30 days. So that's a maximum of over $409,000 that could be tacked on for each violation. And here are the top federal OSHA violations. Something to keep in mind when you're prioritizing your compliance efforts. Fiscal year 2020 was in part during the pandemic, so respiratory protection violations jumped up to number two, pushing scaffolding violations down to number four. An OSHA violation is serious if death or serious physical harm can result from the hazard, and the employer knew or should have known the hazard exists. Each serious violation can cost up to $13,653, but that amount can multiply if an employer has more than one. The top serious violations for fiscal year 2020 are shown here. For general industry, we see HASCOM, machine guarding, respiratory protection, lockout tagout, and forklift violations. For construction, we see fall protection, eye and face protection, ladder, head protection, and aerial lift violations. For shipyards, we see guarding deck openings and edges, electrical cable, PPE, scaffolding or staging, and PPE hazard assessment violations. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, OSHA inspection counts were down in fiscal year 2020, but the number of enforcement units were up slightly. Enforcement units shift the focus to the highest impact and most complex inspections at the highest risk workplaces. 40% of inspections conducted that year were programmed inspections that focused on industries and operations where known hazards exist, such as combustible dusts, chemical processing, ship breaking, and falls in construction. We don't have the actual inspection counts for fiscal year 2021 yet, but it's likely that numbers had been affected by the pandemic there too. But think about this, nearly 29% of inspections in fiscal year 2020 were in compliance. That means 71% had violations, so a lot of employers did not make it through an inspection unscathed. Looking ahead though to fiscal year 2022, which actually started on October 1st, the agency anticipates hiring 207 enforcement personnel with an increase in funding. This is a 15% increase. The president wants to double the number of OSHA inspectors by 2025. Again, we don't want you to miss news and updates on any regulatory changes. So if you joined us late or missed the opportunity earlier in the webcast, we're offering our attendees complimentary access to a wide range of compliance resources and tools in the JJ Keller Safety Management Suite. You'll also access free safety plan templates. This is our most popular tool in the site, so don't miss out. Okay, and along with your access, we'll also send you our white paper, Top EHS Practices, Key Components of a Full Service Safety Program. And there's the poll. So let, let us know your interests. Uh, in addition to regulatory notices, the Safety Management Suite contains all of JJ Keller's most popular safety management tools, including customizable training programs, audit and inspection checklists, written safety plan templates, word-for-word -word federal regulations, state comparisons, and more. So while you make your selection, let's take another question. Uh, Kevin, what do you have for us? Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you. No, getting a lot of good questions and have time for those um, here shortly. But first, I have someone just asking, what is the status of OSHA's HASCOM rule? Okay, I can take that one. Um, so OSHA proposed the HASCOM rule back in February. And last month at the end of September, it hosted about two and a half days of a public hearing to learn about any concerns with the proposed changes. Um, some people objected to classifying the downstream hazards of foreseeable reactions. And there's also been some concern over the narrow concentration ranges for this trade secret chemicals. Um, Cal OSHA even suggested that OSHA withdraw the proposal and start over. At this point, though, um, OSHA says they'll review the concerns addressed at the meeting and probably issue the final rule based on the record as a whole. So probably next year, but at this time, they do not have a tentative date on that. And I will turn that over to Tricia now. Okay, so 
OSHA also has several initiatives, programs, and areas of focus. And each August, OSHA encourages you and your workers to host activities and events to promote safety and health programs as part of Safe and Sound Week. The idea is to show your commitment to the safety of workers, customers, the public, or supply chain partners. The event aligns with guidance to help employers establish a safe and or safety and health program. And each program element in the guidance has a short description, action items, and ways to accomplish those actions. The new administration did not back, uh, bring back the uh, safety and health programs proposed rulemaking though to its regulatory agenda. Under that rule, employers of all sizes would be required to set up a process to find and fix their workplace hazards. But, you know, we may see that rule come back in the future. While heat stress is often associated with workers working outdoors in the heat, OSHA can and has cited heat illness hazards indoors year round. Even with greater enforcement for heat hazards, OSHA continues its campaign to educate workers and employers about the hazards of working in the heat and steps to prevent heat related illness and death. This summer, the agency issued a colorful fact sheet to assist employers and employees. OSHA has been bringing up opioid overdose deaths for construction workers as a current issue. Opioids are commonly prescribed to construction workers who are more likely to die from opioid overdose than the general worker population. The agency says worker suicide is a health issue and covered by its mission. In fact, OSHA says the CDC found the rate of suicide for men working in construction is four times higher than the general working population. So the agency has a topic page on suicide in construction. Several weeks ago, OSHA issued a video and links to several resources. The agency said in a news release that it formed a task force to raise awareness. OSHA's fall prevention campaign has been going since 2014 to prevent falls at construction sites. Falls account for the highest number of deaths in construction. The remaining items on our slide are longtime areas of focus. OSHA says it wants to update its Women in Construction topic page. Also, with new emphasis on building America's infrastructure, work zone safety will get greater attention. Thank you, Rachel. So for years, OSHA has urged cell tower employers to protect workers from deadly falls. A proposal is slated for March. Green jobs are not necessarily safe jobs. Workers face hazards such as falls, confined spaces, electrical, fire, and other hazards. With the new administration's environmental push, OSHA may renew its focus on green job safety. The agency has a topic page on green jobs. OSHA promotes national stand-up for Green Safety Week each year. And finally, OSHA launched the Temporary Worker Initiative in 2013. The agency continues to inspect sites that use temp workers to see they're complying with the OSH Act. And basically you must provide protection and training to temp workers, just like direct hire workers. OSHA's whistleblower protection program enforces whistleblower statutes, protecting workers from retaliation for reporting violations or exercising their rights under the statutes. In fiscal year 2020, we saw more whistleblower cases. OSHA also continues to order companies to pay workers in back wages and damages after the employers retaliated against them for raising safety concerns. OSHA has a number of major rules and more rules coming. The agency also has several enforcement strategies, higher penalties, more inspections planned, and a number of initiatives and areas of focus. Now we are ready to take your questions. Well, excellent. Great job, Tricia and Rachel. Uh, thank you for your insights and expertise. Before we do get started with the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this presentation. Your input is important because it'll help us improve future webcasts, and we really appreciate you taking that extra time to offer feedback. Again, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and then click the send button. Um, now we will get going with the Q&A. First one asks, uh, what is the status of the executive order for employers with 100 or more employees required to have their worker population vaccinated or test negative for COVID? 
Great question, Kevin. Uh, a lot of you have that on your mind right now. It's coming. Um, the rulemaking, the status of it, it, it was sent to the White House Office of Management and Budget on October 12th. And, uh, you know, with this one, I think it, it will go quickly. Uh, the review process with the OMB will go quickly. Although, you know, we don't know. La the last COVID-19 rule took you know, some four months to, to go from the, the beginning of the review period to, to the final approval and in the Federal Register. But I, I would imagine with the, um, uh, the critical nature of, of this particular rule, um, it's going to go quickly. Now, one thing to note um, in the Office of Management and Budget, they do post their meetings and we can see that they're holding meetings almost every hour you know, of the day for the last couple of weeks here. They've had some 78 meetings so far. I'm sure that will continue to roll until, until they've exhausted that or until they've made a decision to approve. So uh, we imagine that this, this rulemaking on vaccination and testing may be approved shortly, November. I mean, but you know, it's anyone's guess uh, how quickly the OMB is gonna going to act. So, great question on that. Thank you, Kevin. Well, sure thing. And then the, the next one stays with that theme, and, and it asks: Does the COVID nineteen vaccination and testing standard apply to public sector employers such as municipalities? Well, the thing is. Um, with municipalities, if you're talking um, local municipalities, uh, state government workers, uh, that sort of thing, uh, those are not covered by the OSHA Act. So it's it's not OSHA is not allowed to to make a rulemaking that covers those workers. That is a gap in the OSH Act, and and Congress for years have, has been trying to close that gap. They need to pass legislation to expand the OSH Act to cover uh, state and municipal public workers. But there is one catch to that. Um, a lot of the states are covered by their own um, state plan state or worker protection state plan state uh, agency. And those states uh, may have taken it upon themselves to close the gap and cover state and municipal workers. So it really depends on what state you're talking about. And so when OSHA uh, publishes this rule in the Federal Register, the states generally, the state plan states, if you will, uh, generally have about 30 days to get their rule, uh, adopt the rule or make something more stringent, um, you know, get something out for their states and they may very well cover state and municipal public government workers. So it, it, it depends. Next one, uh, do you have any idea when the proposed 9921 executive order OSHA language will be published? Uh, if you are talking about this vaccination, I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, but uh, I think you're talking about this COVID-19 vaccination and testing and the timing of that, correct? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that goes back to that, you know, it's at the OMB, OMB is going through review. It's one thing to note though, um, the OMB generally, if it's an ordinary rulemaking, they usually take 90 to 120 days to review any given rule. And by the way, this is a final rule that's coming. It won't be a proposal, there will be no comment notice and comment or anything like that. Once it's published in the Federal Register, it is effective on that day. Of course, there may be some compliance dates that OSHA lists in the rule, which may give some time. I, you know, it, 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 it's anyone's guess as to what's going to be in the rule. But again, because of the nature and the criticalness of, of this rulemaking, I would imagine the OMB is going to try to approve the rule as quickly as possible once they do, um, OSHA is free to publish it in the Federal Register. Does the discussion of untrained employees include contractors? Yeah, we mentioned uh, a violation that was pretty significant for uh, 
a, an employer that had untrained workers, and then they took that as a willful violation. They multiplied that penalty by six because there were six untrained. So when it comes to untrained workers, um, and you're talking about contractors now, you know, you have this host employer, if you will, and a contractor at the site uh, with their employees. Uh, it depends, I mean, everybody's responsible for their own employees, right? So the contractor's uh, responsible for protecting their own employees, but the host employer too may very well be responsible for the protections and the training of contractors to ensure that that's done. And the reason is, um, OSHA has what they call a, a multi-employer enforcement policy. And under that, they look at who controls the hazards, who, um, you know, there, there are four types of employers that they list there. And so the host employer may have some responsibility and may very well be cited along with a contractor if those contract employees are untrained. So there's a chance there that there's a penalty uh, if for untrained uh contract workers. Thank you. Has OSHA made any move to extend record keeping to public government agencies? Okay, that, that goes back to that OSH Act again. Right now, OSHA just can't do it on their own. They need Congress to change the OSH Act to um, uh, close that gap. To So then once that happens, um, they are free to, um, you know, create you know, the regulations will apply then to the public sector. They can enforce those regulations in the public sector, but until that gap is closed, um, they cannot. Now, there is one, <laughs> I'm talking state and municipalities, but when you're talking federal government workers, um, there is another regulation that says that, you know, the federal government does um, follow the the OSH Act and, and all of that. And, and it's up to the, uh, the secretary of those federal agencies to, um, you know, tweak the rules in any form. Anyway, it is a little complex there, but I believe under the federal, uh, at the federal level, those government workers would, would be covered. How long is an ETS good for and what is the renewal process? Uh, well, it's our understanding that an ET, emergency temporary standard is temporary, okay? Um, it's in effect for six months. Um, be, think about it this way. When it's finalized, there was no notice and comment. So um, it, it will go six months. And in that duration, OSHA may uh, issue an, uh, a, a proposed rule and a final rule uh, to make a permanent rule, if you will, um, with notice and comment. But generally, the emergency temporary standard is only effective for six months. Um, uh, um, yeah, until it goes through notice and comment, it, 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 it really has a short duration. Uh, I had a question that actually was addressed to, to Rachel. It asks, um, can you please explain how the National Emphasis Program works? Sure. Um, so the, the National Emphasis Programs or NEPs, these are enforcement programs that certain target certain high hazard industries and certain hazards for inspection. And currently OSHA has 10 of these NEPs. Um, they add, plan to add one more on heat hazards. And so when you hear about program inspections, NEPs fall into that group of inspections. These are planned inspections with certain targets in mind. And the list of NEPs may change over time as OSHA focuses its attention on certain industries and certain hazards. Looks like we've got time for, for one more. And this one was to, to Tricia. It says, what, what is the look back time for repeat violations? About how far back will OSHA look? Oh, uh, great question. So uh, right now, uh, OSHA looks back had employer citations uh, issued within five years. Um, you know, um, early on they had a three-year uh, look back, but now that's five years that they look back uh, at, at your history um, to see if if you were in fact cited for the same or you know a substantially similar condition or hazard. So um, now I I think the citation only counts if it has become a final order. So 
you know, if it's contested, it's kind of in the air there. Um, and, and so a final order happens when the employer does not contest the violation, um, or if it is contested, uh, it, it would become final when the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission or a court uh, of some kind decides the case. Um, and, or one other option, there's a settlement that, that would put a, a final date on that. Um, bear in mind, uh, repeat violations are pretty serious there. Um, they bring a, a civil penalty anyway uh, of that maximum, uh, about $136,000. So great, great question. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. Thank you both. Unfortunately, we have run out of time today. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speakers. And once again, we hope you take that extra time to fill out the evaluation survey and provide your feedback. Um, with that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Tricia Hotkovich, Rachel Krupsack, everyone at JJ Keller, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day.